Good day, all, and welcome to the inaugural hydrology section, AGU hydrology section, early career award webinar. I'm Scott Tyler. I'm the president of the section, and it's my pleasure to start today's webinar. The section's early career awards are given to up to three young scientists, with less than 10 years since their PhD. Successful nominees are scientists who demonstrate outstanding contributions to hydrologic sciences, education, or societal impacts and also show exceptional promise for continued contributions to hydrology throughout their career. This year, we have three amazing researchers who've been sharing and will continue to share their stories with you. Veronica Morales, Simone Fatiki, and Nico Wanders. Nico will be presenting next week. Today is Simone, and last week, uh, Veronica presented her results. Just a few logistics for the webinar. I see people are still joining. We'll, I'll speak a little more slowly so we can make sure we all get you on. Um, we are recording the webinar, and uh, for those of you who missed last week's, uh, it is just now posted on the Hydrology section website under um, interviews and lectures. If you come down below the, I think it's the Witherspoon uh, lectures, you'll see a new link for the early career lectures, and it's on YouTube. So you can, uh, that whole uh, uh, seminar was recorded last time. If for some reason we have a technical issue during the seminar, and it's possible I may get dropped off because we're having a windstorm in Reno yet again. We seem to have one every Friday morning for these. Um, we will try to get everything back online. If for some reason we don't, we will record the seminar offline and make sure we post it, okay? Um, please type your questions into the question box. And if you prefer that we don't read your name off, just make a note of that. Um, but otherwise, I will um, say who the questions are from. Uh, we should have ample time for questions at the end. And I'll read as many questions as we have time for. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Valery Ivanov from the University of Michigan. Uh, and he will, he was, he led the nomination effort for Simone Fatiki, and he will give the citation and introduce our seminar speaker for today. I'll see you at the end. Thank you. Valeria, you are on. Thank you, Scott. It is with great honor that I introduce Dr. Simone Fatiki, an LRD of the 2020 AGU Hydrologic Sciences Early Career Award. Simone is an inspiring young scientist with deep understanding of physical and biological processes at the interfaces of hydrology, biogeosciences, and climate. He is at the forefront of research in various disciplines where he develops new mechanistic models to quantify interactions among different components of the biosphere, hydrosphere, and pedosphere. His research and network of collaborations are highly, highly interdisciplinary and diverse, as evidenced from his publications in journals ranging from hydrology and climate to ecosystem science and plant physiology, which is a unique trait among his peers, as very few are able to cross these boundaries even at the peak of their careers. Within his main field of expertise in hydrology, the spectrum of topics addressed by Simone is remarkable, from stochastic hydrology to distributive physical and biogeochemical modeling, hydrology and climate change, soil moisture dynamics, time series analysis, precipitation extremes, and more. He possesses the unique ability to identify and penetrate topics across different disciplines with deep understanding and creativity without losing breath and perspective. Simone's publications have already made significant impacts despite the early stage of his career. Several of his recent publications have already been cited more than 100 times. Without an exaggeration, Simone is a trailblazer in several research fields. Simone is also a dedicated mentor and an outstanding teacher. He advised several PhD students and postdoctoral scientists, most of whom continue to pursue careers in academia. He was also an instructor in several courses at the Zurich and various international summer schools. Simone's service to scientific community is outstanding. He has been a tireless convener and chairman of many AG sessions at AGU and EGU. He is currently Water Resources Research Associate Editor, and remarkably, he received excellence in refereeing citations from two AGU journals, Water Resources Research and Geophysical Research Letters. Simona has also been a prominent member of international working groups that are pushing research front lines. In summary, the remarkable track record and the outstanding scientific achievements reflects on Simona's exceptional personality, talent, and promise that are 
without a reservation, meritful of the 2020 AGU Hydrologic Sciences Early Career Award. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie, for the overlay kindly citation. It's really a great honor to receive the Early Career Hydrological Science Award from the American Geophysical Union. This has been an incredibly good news in an otherwise complicated year. And there will be so many people to thank, and I would not have the time to go through all the acknowledgements. I will just include a few on the first few slides. But uh, at least I would like to thank the entire community of AGU. So really, thank you. So I was trying to come up with a, a summary way to a way of summarizing uh, all the people that have collaborated with me throughout these uh, last 10 years. And the best way I found was uh, to come up with a point uh, with a word cloud. Uh, this word cloud is actually indicating the co-authorship of my papers. And doing this exercise, I actually realized that I'm uh, a couple of co-authors short from uh, one co-author per year. So there have been a lot of people working with me, and I really would like to thank all of them. And probably many connected that they will recognize their name. At least it's readable if you have at least a couple of papers with me. So to all those people which are written here, really a big thank. But at least uh, I would like also to make a few special acknowledgement. One is to Enrica Caporali and uh, Valeria Ivanov, who have been with me since the PhD times. So really, thank you. Another one is to Paolo Burlando and Peter Molnar, who took me at ETH Zurich, and uh, they're sharing with me almost nine years at ETH uh, with a very interesting and inspiring discussions. Then I would like to thank uh, Athanasius Pascalis, Cristoforo Pappas, which have happened to be my first two PhD student, uh, and uh, since then collaborators and friends, and also Gabriele Manoli and Nadav Peleg, who have been my, happened to be my first two postdoctoral fellow, and uh, since then have been friends and collaborators as well. I think I was extremely lucky to work with all these people here, and I couldn't not uh, ask for better. I would like also to thank the people who took the time to write the support letters, the nomination package together with uh, Valeri. So thanks to Enrique Vivoni, to Gil Borel, to Gabi Catullo, and to Daniel. Of course, I should mention many other people, including all my uh, most recent PhD students, but unfortunately, there is not much time. Then another aspect, when you ask to do a lecture about uh, ecohydrology, frontiers in ecohydrology, was to go back to the root of ecohydrology. So if you are asking a Google Scholar an easy web of knowledge, the first time that the ecohydrologic term has been used in the literature, they point, point both to this paper of Ingram in 1987. So I'm not 100% sure it's indeed the first time, but uh, this paper, I wasn't able to read when it was out. I was still in my kindergarten time, but it was a nice, very nice description of the functioning of Mayans, Pitlands in Scotland, where ecohydrology was just mentioned once in the title and once in the introduction. But I think the idea was to convey the role that vegetation has in influencing the water, mostly at the surface level. So water you can actually see on the surface. Then there was this uh, paper where I think most of the ecohydrological community will recognize a, a sort of the beginning of the field. So this was a, a commentary or opinion paper written by Ignacio Rodriguez Iturbe in 2000, where he was really making the point of the importance of connecting vegetation with the hydrological cycle in both ways. So vegetation is affecting that hydrological cycle, but also the hydrological cycle is very important for vegetation function. Also this paper I didn't read when it was out, I was in, at the end of my high school with other priorities at the time, but there was this paper from Valeri Ivanov, Brass, and Vivoni, uh, which was very influential to me in 2008. And I actually read this paper before it was uh, actually when it was in press. And uh, this to me was inspiring because it was showing not only the importance of plant water interaction, 
but also the fact that you can describe uh, through physical law with a mechanistic approach, very well informed parameterization, this interaction, and you can actually build uh, uh, models for understanding the system and potentially also for predicting the system. But we have also to mention that this is a very hydrological perspective. If you will talk with any plant physiology, we'll tell you, well, eco-hydrology existed way before the hydrological community come up with the name. And indeed, if you think about a book like Plants and Microclimate of Jones in 83, this was a, a book that nowadays we can regard the, to be largely a ecohydrological type of book with a lot of ecohydrological content. So I'm going to talk a little bit more beyond ecohydrology. So if you look at this picture here, many of you will see a very nice alpine landscape. This is Alptal near Einsiedeln in Switzerland. But if you are more of a land surface person or climate scientist, then you will start figuring out the long wave fluxes, the sensible latentite, which is emitted by this landscape in different ways. If you are an hydrologist, you will start thinking about respiration, evaporation from the ground, potential infiltration or groundwater dynamics. If you are a carbon cycle person, you would like to see photosynthesis, carbon allocation to different plant compartments, uh, building up of soil organic matter, uh, respiration uh, from the ecosystem. And if you are a soil biogeochemistry person, very likely you would like to see how much nutrients are uptaken by the plant, how much are leached in the, in the stream water and, and other type of microbial dynamics in the soil. And the point I want to make here is that all these components, they are interconnected and they are affecting each other. So you can do great things just looking at one of those components, but there are problems where you really need to connect all of these processes and aspects together because they are affecting each other. And so quoting John Lennon, try to imagine if we can take a piece of this landscape and translate the function of the ecosystem and the hydrology in a some mathematical form first and numerical model later, and just based on meteorological forcing, some vegetation properties hopefully available everywhere in the globe, uh, some soil properties hopefully available, available everywhere in the globe, only based a priori on this information, we can reproduce the fluxes, processes, dynamics of the system. And I'm mentioning here only a few without any particular relevance or importance, just to make a few examples of fluxes and processes up to the point that you can arrive even potentially to describe water chemistry starting from a first order principle. So here the question, and it sounds a little bit of an engineering question is, can we do it? And the answer is probably not, or at least not yet, maybe we will never be able to do it. But I will argue that the journey, the travel, the path that you will be doing and try to search or answering this question will lead to a lot of science, will lead to a lot of discoveries. And I think it's the path that is very important in, in this direction. And if you think about can we do it, it was also the question when the, the man went to the moon or for Mars exploration, and we have done a great science out of this, of this type of question. And of course, many of you will think about, okay, but there is a plenty of spatial heterogeneity on the land surface, on the subsurface. We have problem of scale. We measure things on a given scale. You have to model at another scale. Uh, some of the equations, they don't apply. There is a soil structure, preferential flow. We don't know how to model carbon allocation and many more. It's all true. I mean, we have all these problems which we need to be very well aware. And we need to understand when they are very important that they can uh, stop doing, uh, uh, certain things or, or when we can actually still uh, provide some answer on the functioning of the system. And indeed we have uh, on our favor though, conservation of mass, energy, momentum, stoichiometric constraint, ecological principle. And uh, it may seem little, but I will argue later on that those type of constraints are extremely important uh, to draw many conclusions, especially to prevent uh, findings which will not be supported by these, by these constraints. And we were trying to implement all this complex, or at least a part of this complexity, not all of these, in a mechanistic terrestrial biosphere model or ecohydrological model, if you want. In certain aspects, I'm not going to enter any detail of this model, which is called TNC, but it's trying to solve a number of the processes I was mentioning before in a fully coupled manner, in a fully coupled way. 
So it's really trying to connect the vegetation dynamics, hydrology, land surface processes, and soil biogeochemistry more recently. And how we use this model? Well, we typically look at different case studies. Uh, here, I like this white tiger diagram where you have mean annual precipitation and mean annual temperature and a, a very simplified representation of the main biomes. Each point is one case study we ran in the past. Uh, and uh, we really try to cover any type of biomes and climate. And of course, we will need to have to force the model some uh, hourly meteorological forcing and, uh, and uh, some information about the system. So many of these case studies, they correspond either to flux tower or to uh, critical zone observatories, long-term ecological research experiment. And just to give you a few examples, uh, you can compare with flux tower data of gross primary production, latent heat, uh, Sensible heat, this is a site, a savanna site in Australia. You can compare with the dynamics of litharia index uh, um, in the, this is a site on the Austrian Alps, or you can compare also with, uh, for instance, a fresh fruit bunch. This is a site, uh, oil palm plantation in Indonesia. So to give a range of the diversity of output that those models can produce and the type of comparison you can make. But when it comes to comparison with observation, I would argue we always need to be extremely careful. So this is an example I really like because it's a, a location where we have two independent observation of evapotranspiration. One coming from a lysimeter and the other one coming from a flux tower. And the third to construct this three box, uh, three scatter plot is actually the model. So if you will have only one observation, you will very likely will conclude that the model is explaining 75 to 70% of the variability of the observation. But now you have two observation and the model. If I don't put the axis, which I'm putting now, it will, not, it will be very hard to say what is what. Just to remind us that the observation of nature, especially at larger scale, it's always inherently uncertain. And we need to consider for this to the point that if you go back to this very nice commentary on science from Oreskes, he was arguing that when it's about numerical model or health science, verification and validation are almost impossible because those are open system. And the best you can hope is for confirmation. And confirmation needs to be repeated two times, repeated for the scope of what you would like to do. So that's why I like the word confirmation way more than validation, which is more in fashion in hydrology. An example of model confirmation, especially when you go to this type of distributed picture, this is a catchment in Switzerland where we simulate the hydrology at a relatively high resolution. You get this pattern of effective saturation, so it's the water content in the top meter of soil or evapotranspiration. And those patterns are extremely difficult to confirm with data to the point that ultimately you end up always with the, the catchment integrator, which is a stream flow. In this case, it's a very nice simulation, but there is no uh, reason why a priori should be always uh, uh, so nice. And I will argue that actually stream flow will not be the most informative metrics to constrain, man constrain many of those models. But let's move to the type of science question we can ask with this tool. This is the one we were looking at the soil biogeochemistry dynamic, and we were asking ourselves how much of the respiration which is coming out of the soil is produced by different uh, uh, living uh, biomass components. So we were running a number of sites, in this case, more than 20 sites, and ranking them in terms of net primary production. But you can see this axis also as the axis of wetness. So from dry site to wet site on the right. And uh, what we were finding is that uh, fungi were contributing to roughly 40% of the soil respiration, fine roots 32%, and actually declining as, uh, as you go to wetter and more productive sites, Bacteria, 25%. I have to mention, we don't have any agricultural sites here. And macrofauna, which was contributing for much less. Of course, this is an interesting question to ask, but it's very difficult to confirm. But if you took the global soil respiration database, what you actually can find is uh, that uh, you have 68% uh, uh, roughly on our simulation of the ratio between heterotrophic respiration and soil respiration. And this global soil respiration database gives 63% of this quantity. And these are two completely different estimates of the, of the estimate of heterotrophic respiration 
which uh, one is coming purely from model, it's not a constrained quantity, the other one is coming from data. Of course, they are both biased in the selection of site. Okay. Another type of question we can ask was related to the effect of elevated CO2. We know, we all know about that the elevated CO2 is going to lead to what is called fertilization role. So it's a stimulating plant productivity. But at the same time, there have been a number of papers, including this one in science, showing the semi-arid system, they are dominating the trend and variability of the terrestrial CO2 sink, even though supposedly they have less uh, productivity. So our question was, uh, how much direct and indirect effect of CO2 are contributing to this, to this response? And I'm going to explain in a second what I mean for direct and indirect effect of CO2. So direct effect is the one everybody knows in terms of uh, uh, chloroplast level, where you have more CO2 and you will be doing more photosynthesis, which potentially leads to a larger productivity of vegetation. The indirect effect is the, the first one, it's through soil moisture saving. So more CO2 means more food for the plant, they tend to close tomato, they tend to save soil moisture. This may reduce the water stress of the plant and increase productivity. Another effect is through leaf area index. So a larger amount of photosynthesis can produce more leaf area and has a compounding effect. So you have more leaf area, you do more photosynthesis. And this typically has a positive effect, but since you may do also more respiration, then this may lead uh, also to a negative effect in certain cases. And the fourth one is related to the fact that if you increase the leaf area, then you also have more transpiration. If you have more transpiration, then you decrease the soil moisture, you can increase water stress, and this is typically negative. So when you run a real experiment, like a phase experiment, those effects, they're all combined together. That's what you observe in the real field. But with the model, you can actually partition those effects. I'm not going to explain how, because we don't have time, but you have to trust me that we can partition. So we ran two experiments of ambient CO2, elevated CO2, and what we observed in terms of vegetation productivity, in terms of NTP, was that if you look only to direct effect, those will be larger in wet sites. So the x-axis is wetness index, precipitation over potential evapotranspiration. The direct effect will be larger and on the order of 20%. But then you have the indirect effect through soil moisture saving, which are much stronger on semi-arid and arid sites, which is kind of expected. But also the indirect effect through leaf area index are stronger on dry places, because in those places, increasing also a little bit of the leaf area, since it's not large to start with, can lead to quite significant uh, uh, large productivity. Of course, as economists remind us, there is no free lunch. So some of the water you will be saving uh, through stomatal closure will be spent by the larger leaf index or by the increased growing season, which is leading to a negative indirect effect. But overall, the, so, the sum of all these uh, indirect effects was accounting for roughly 28% uh, of the net primary production response uh, uh, of those ecosystems. So it was very significant uh, uh, for the overall response to elevated CO2. When it comes to hydrology, so if we now look to evapotranspiration, the story is quite uh, different in the sense the response is much smaller. We are not talking anymore about 20, 30%, but 6, 8% maximum. And when you approach in dry place, you have a zero response in terms of evapotranspiration to elevated CO2. And this should not be surprising because semi-arid and arid places are dominated in the long term by total annual precipitation. So regardless of the elevated CO2 you have, Regardless of the leaf area index, overall, the evapotranspiration is constrained by precipitation. If you look indeed to the direct effect and the indirect effect, they tend to compensate each other, especially on the semi-arid plates. But indirect effect in this case are even more significant than the direct one because you have the constraint of the water budget. So you may not expect huge changes in a, in a hydrological cycle. So what is happening, you are saving the soil moisture through closing the stomata, but that saving water is used uh, later on uh, in the growing season. So you increase productivity, but ultimately in the long term, you are not changing uh, significantly the, uh, the uh, water budget. Okay. Another example I would like to show you is related to these uh, uh, long-term eco-hydrological studies. 
So here we exploit uh, the reconstruction of precipitation over 4,500 years done by Maureen and co-authors uh, using the lake level proxy of the Dead Sea. So here you have meter below sea level rather than above sea level because it's the Dead Sea. And uh, um, you, they reconstruct precipitation. So we combine this reconstruction of precipitation. We also proxy for temperature, CO2, and uh, solar radiation of the past 4,500 years. And we want to simulate the eco-hydrology of this type of ecosystem. This is mostly grass and shrubs, sclerophyll vegetation uh, on the area around Jerusalem. And to know how recharge to the groundwater was affected by those climatic and vegetation changes throughout uh, 4,500 years. So we did test the water budget of the historical period, which is the one in the slide. Uh, um, and we also checked that the recharge we simulate was corresponding fairly well with the measurement and observation from springs in the area. So we try again to do our best in terms of confirmation of the model before running this type of numerical experiment. And when you run this numerical experiment, you need the aid of a weather generator because you need to reconstruct the hourly scale climate for 4,500 years. So it's a stochastic reconstruction. So you don't have to check the single day, uh, but uh, definitely on a 30 years time scale makes sense. And what you see that the temperature is oscillating uh, throughout the different periods, precipitation even more. If you look at the recharge, it's actually peaking at the end of the Roman war period when precipitation is large. So not a big surprise, precipitation is uh, strongly shaping the recharge pattern. But if you look to vegetation dynamics, uh, yes, there is an increase in vegetation during this warm and wet period, but the peak of vegetation productivity is actually happening on the last few years in response to elevated CO2. To level of productivity and also leaf area index, I'm not showing this, which have no correspondence of the previous 4,500 years. It's plenty actually of paper documenting this greening, especially in semi-arid semi place. But what we want to understand is that this relation between precipitation and recharge was indeed modified in this last few decades. So we were plotting the average recharge over 30 years, average precipitation over 30 years for all the 30 years of the 4,500 uh, years we ran. And what you see is on this uh, long-term average, it's almost a linear relation between recharge and precipitation. And even the last uh, uh, few decades, which are the big dots here with a lot of CO2 and also higher temperature, are not deviating significantly from this line. Despite the vegetation, it's actually much more productive, the leaf area index is larger. And we were asking ourselves why, and the answer was again on this indirect effect of CO2. So you basically have much more vegetation, but since you're closing the stomata response to elevated CO2, the overall evapotranspiration doesn't change that much. Is going to stay the same for the foreseeable future? That the, was the other question. So we ran a number of uh, scenarios in a sort of sensitivity analysis when we modify temperature and CO2, and we look to the change in recharge, but for a fixed precipitation. So precipitation is the same in all these uh, analyses. And we see that the CO2 increase and temperature does increase that much. Actually, you can even increase the recharge because of the water saving. But if temperature is exceeding the two, 2.5 degrees, uh, then you end up in situation which are deviating from this line, which has been valid for the last 4,500 years, at least according to the model. And even though this deviation, which are around 30%, will not be unprecedented, uh, given the fact that recharge has been also much smaller than present, uh, but they will be unprecedented for this type of precipitation. So if then you combine also some variability in precipitation, you may end up in condition uh, that have never been experienced before and may jeopardize water resources. And let me come to the last uh, case study. So here we are going back to the European Alps, and uh, there was an increasing concern about the fact that uh, more frequent and intense dry periods, which happened in the Alps in the recent years, like 2015, 2018, or the very famous uh, dry summer of 2003, they are occurring more often, and they can jeopardize water resources. To the point, uh, and the specific question we wanted to test was this drought paradox, that during this uh, warm and sunny and uh, summer with lack of precipitation, vegetation may not be responding in a negative way, so it's not water stress, but it's actually 
favored by this sunny and dry condition to the point they can amplify the runoff deficit. So vegetation responds positively to this condition and can decrease the amount of water in the streams. This has been demonstrated locally, but it was not clear which effect was creating at the entire alpine re level or region. So we took really the entire alpine region, which is one quarter of a million of square kilometer. We ran at the very high resolution um, of 250 meters. We simulated three years at the hourly scale from 2000 to 2003, including a super wet year in 2001 at the super dry summer of 2003. Uh, we used different data set to force the model, to confirm the model uh, in terms of properties, but there is not really calibration or anything going on here. Also, because this simulation takes on a single CPU times roughly 70 years of simulation. Of course, we were using high performance computing, a massive uh, parallel simulation to do so. So jumping immediately to the result, that's what we may see. We may see this uh, uh, map where you have latent heat across the entire alpine region average over the three years of simulation. Uh, very nice picture. If you zoom in, you can start to see details. So you see here, the, it's the region of Switzerland around Interlaken, if you are familiar with, those are lakes with a larger latent heat emission. This is a glacier with very low latent heat emission. You can even separate the north and south exposed slope in this type of, of dynamics. And of course, we did our best to confirm with snow cover measurement, with discharge, and many other things we could compare the model results uh, with. And just to show a few examples, this is a very qualitative comparison with uh, Google Earth. Uh, this is the LIPAR index we simulate in the model. This is Google Earth picture, just to give an idea of a qualitative comparison of what we get in the model, what we were simulating. Or you can get map like this one, which is the water content integrated over the first meter of soil in millimeters. This is a, like a, a, a zoom on the Austrian Alps. This is Piria Valley toward Wolfsburg. But just to give the idea of the richness of dynamics and aspects you can capture, of course, the big question is how realistic they will be and can, can we use those? And I think this is not still completely answered, but at least I think for the type of confirmation was enough to look at the anomaly of the summer of 2003. So summer of 2003 in the Alps was really dry. If you take a real observation now, so of stream flow, the runoff anomaly was on average of 50% of the long-term average of stream flow, and very few catchment had the positive anomaly downstream of glaciers. And for some catchment, the anomaly was larger than 50%, actually for several catchment. This is from measurements. From the model, what we simulate, if we plot the anomaly of evapotranspiration over the entire alpine region during the growing season of 2003, what we see is this picture. So the bright yellow color are positive anomaly, where vegetation is responding positively to this dry and warm condition, but not only dry and warm, also to the lack of precipitation is responding positively. Almost everywhere precipitation was below the average uh, during the summer. But when you look at the valleys uh, and the lowland plains, the story is very different. You see vegetation is stressed and you have this uh, uh, blackish color, dark color, which is indicating indeed a negative anomaly of evapotranspiration, as you will generally expect during a dry or warm summer. If I zoom on a valley like Valle d'Aosta, you see the valley is behaving quite differently from the mountain surrounding it, even though most of the people, of course, will have the experience of more the condition in the valleys. If you look at different vegetation types, they are also behaving differently. So evergreen trees, which have deeper roots, they tend to have a positive anomaly throughout the entire uh, growing season from May to September, and they have a positive anomaly at all elevation, which is actually amplifying at high elevation throughout the summer. But if you look at grassland, uh, those have a positive anomaly at the beginning of the growing season, but this positive anomaly becomes negative uh, during the mid of the summer at low elevation. And also high elevation, it's almost going down to zero and recovering a little bit in September. Just to give that different vegetation types at different elevation may respond differently. So this distributed spatial feature, it's actually quite important to analyze the system. And if you want to summarize this study in a single sentence or in a tweet, you can say lush vegetation and drier rivers is what we may expect in future summers, summers in the Alps, at least in those dry and warm summers that will occur in the next few decades. 
uh, so with the vegetation amplifying the runoff deficit, our estimate was that roughly in this case, vegetation was amplifying the runoff deficit of 25-30% in comparison to what expected only by a decrease in precipitation. Coming to the conclusion, I think I show a few examples where, where mechanistic hydrological models they provide insight of water and carbon cycle, which would not be possible to obtain otherwise, like the distributed water budget of the Alpine region or the reconstruction of 4,500 years of recharge dynamics in the Jerusalem area. And those tools, I think, are especially important to design a virtual experiment. And if you think about especially below ground compartments where it's difficult to observe, if you want to study the interaction between soil microbial dynamics, how they affect the carbon storage, plant growth, nutrient cycle, I cannot see many other ways they're not trying to apply this model, despite the huge amount of limitations, which are of course there. And this will be even more relevant in a changing climate because many ecosystems they are going to respond to this changing climate in, a, in ways which have never been observed in the past. It's not just about temperature. CO2, as I was showing, is going to be a very important control of plant productivity, of water use efficiency, and uh, this indirect effect of CO2 fertilization may be relevant in many places for the hydrological cycle, especially as you go far in the past, uh, sorry, far in the future. And of course, it's not just about model data and observation are fundamental. But what I would stress, it's a critical reality checks, which is fundamental, not a blind comparison between observation and model simulation, because the observation of natural system at large scale are inherently messy and uncertain, despite all the effort we are going to do. So the critical thinking here is really fundamental. And finally, I would like to leave you rather with a, than a conclusion with question. So how long the terrestrial carbon sink is going to persist at the current rate? We don't know. This is an outstanding question because terrestrial carbon sink was providing probably one of the largest ecosystem services that the humankind ever received, sinking 25 to 30 percent of CO2 we are emitting. Or VPD levels, which are for sure going to increase in the future, how they're going to impact plant water stress and potentially even plant mortality. Or in a more practical way, can we use this tool to guide conservation projects uh, to decide uh, where carbon sequestration or preservation of freshwater resources may be prioritized. And I think this will be plenty of those type of opportunity in the future. And let me finally thank uh, the funding agency who supported through this year, the five institutions that gave me an office uh, from the University of Florence, uh, U Braunschweig, University of Michigan, ETH, and the more recently National University of Singapore, uh, so the whole are supported and very, very finally, I would like to thank uh, my parents because all the support they provide me ever since, since I was born pretty much. And with this, I thanks for your attention. I'm glad to take any question. Thank you, Simone. Thank you very much. An applause from all of us. Very good. Much appreciated. Um, Please put your questions into the question box. Um, and I do apologize, someone submitted a question at about 34 minutes past the hour. And I, I was trying to open it, I accidentally deleted it. So it was someone who I think uh, wished to remain anonymous. So please retype your question in, I couldn't bring it back. So, um, Simone, I'll, I'll sort of kick off a, a wonderful tour de force of, uh, of eco-hydrology. In, in early on, the, when you were talking about the partitioning of uh, in semi-arid areas of net primary productivity and and uh, uh, and water, it, it seems to me that in very arid regions, there's very little coupling between, say, evapotranspiration and and the climate itself or the precipitation. And then in in very wet regions, there's very little coupling between what the vegetation is doing and the and the and the climate, but somewhere in between, there's a point where there there can be some strong coupling, and I'm thinking of memory effects from, say, uh, uh, intense thunderstorms, where you end up with recycling precipitation very quickly locally. Do you have a sense of of when do we need to worry about how these processes are affecting the the, the local meteorology? I agree with what you just said. I mean, there is this intermediate range where uh, land atmospheric feedbacks may be very important. Uh, and uh, and uh, 
I I don't know if you, which range you intend in terms of wetness index, but uh, I guess uh, anything which is around one of wetness index is where you may expect that the vegetation will play the most important role in modifying the water budget because uh, when it's uh, super dry, as you said, basically it's going to uh, transpire or evapotranspire equal to the annual precipitation. So it's annual precipitation dictating the system. And when you go to very wet place, it will be probably limited very much by uh, energy that goes into the system. But there is an intermediate range. And this goes back to the simple Boudicca description in a certain way. When, when it comes to land atmospheric interaction, which I think was a little bit more of your question, uh, those I, there are, I think, a specific place where, where, uh, where had been shown to be the most uh, affected place in terms of land atmospheric interaction, like the Sile region, or, or some, uh, like for instance, the Borneo region is another one where most of the rainfall is recycled. There have been a study on the, even on the Amazon. So that I think goes a little bit beyond this, uh, this uh, uh, wetness index or, or, or dryness index across uh, uh, one. So in that case, I think uh, it will be more a sort of local climate condition, seasonality, and, uh, and uh, so it's, uh, it, the two things are not necessarily related. I think that's what I want to mean. Okay. When you talk about land atmospheric interaction, or when you talk about vegetation controls on the hydrological cycle. Okay, thank you. All right, we have a question. Um, are anthropogenic induced land use changes, such as the Mediterranean deforestation, integrated into your modeling? And what are the most valuable data sets to help constrain model parameters that, in your model? Okay, so we can uh, run the model with uh, various management scenarios. So we can uh, definitely have a lot of type of management scenarios for grassland, like fertilization, grass cutting. Also in terms of forest, we recently added the possibility to have uh, uh, wildfires. We, we are doing actually study in Australia on wildfires uh, effect on and vegetation recovery. Uh, we have done a study on uh, logging and uh, vegetation recovery. So we have now the capability to include a, a certain level of disturbances. Of course, uh, when you're going to simulate this long period, some of the uncertainty increase. Um, so we always need to be very careful in which type of results we get and how to interpret. With, when it comes to which data are um, more important to constrain the model, well, of course, uh, the, here it's more you have, better it is in general. But we have been using a lot of flux tower data that despite all the uncertainty they have, the fact that they don't close the energy budget, but if they are used in a critical way, they are extremely important. Any data about uh, uh, vegetation productivity of the ecosystem, like above ground net primary production, the very often ecologists they collect or, see, or even uh, increasing biomass of trees, those would be quite relevant to constrain remote sensing product to constrain the phenology of the system when the remote sensing especially is done uh, locally rather than from satellite, it's even better. Uh, and also data about subsurface in terms of soil temperature, soil moisture can be important. But again, I will stress that all those data are all fundamental, but they need to be interpreted very carefully when you compare with the model. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, this question comes from Danny Orr. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on machine learning in this endeavor? I think uh, there is a great opportunity to combine uh, process-based mechanistic modeling with machine learning in various ways. One clear way I see is to use machine learning to map uh, uh, some of the parameters in space because uh, we, we, I mean, some of the parameters will be somehow model related. Uh, uh, or, or at least have some dependence on the scale of the model. So it's not that you can measure in the field your photosynthetic capacity and apply that, uh, that maximum rubisco capacity directly to the model. So if you have uh, your model, uh, let's say, tested in many, many sites, then you can use machine learning to try to extrapolate uh, across landscape, uh, uh, similarly uh, as it has been done with uh, uh, real data. So I think this is one approach. Another approach which many people are actually now following, also in climate science or in other fields, 
is to, to substitute the certain component of the model, which are very difficult to describe mechanistically or process based as, for instance, uh, I don't know, uh, cloud parameterization uh, through machine learning. The result seems to be very promising. So I guess this would be possible also for some component of the hydrological models where we have a pure description of the system. Maybe we have some observation and then we can try to apply machine learning. But machine learning requires always a quite significant amount of, of data. And uh, you always need to also check that what you're doing is still preserving uh, all the constraint I was mentioning at the beginning, which is extremely important. Otherwise, you may end up uh, with some conclusion which is uh, more unrealistic than running uh, blindly the model, the process-based model. Okay, maybe I'll just follow up. Thank you. Uh, uh, a little bit on that. Do you have a sense of of which of the processes in the echo in your echo echo, echo hydrological modeling that that would have sufficient data? to 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 develop a machine learning value or the end once processes we don't know well well i think it would be mostly to some of the above ground processes definitely we don't have much data on the below ground or within the plant to constrain to constrain with machine learning if i think the carbon allocation data are extremely sparse that it would be very difficult. But for some process related to maybe to radiation, uh, canopy radiation uh, transmission, uh, or uh, uh, roughness effect of vegetation and so on, maybe we can think about using uh, uh, machine learning. Definitely, I didn't have the time, but of course, there is quite a, a significant difference between how well we can constrain and simulate above ground processes. And, in comparison to below ground processes. I still think when we go below 60 centimeter, I like to say that we end up in an uncharted territory where we don't really know what's gonna happen very well. Okay, thank you. All right, the next question comes from, from Larry Band. Have you used your modeling approaches to investigate the trade-offs between water and nutrient limitations over current dry to wet climates and over climate change effects? This is a very relevant question, and uh, I would, I'm saying uh, since the soil biogeochemistry component of the model has been recently developed, only well, it was like a six, seven years project, but it was is available since 2019. We didn't have, I didn't have too much time to explore fully this type of trade-off, but it's definitely on the agenda because I think they are extremely relevant, and also the role of, for instance, of microbial diversity how it's feeding back to plant productivity and potentially hydrological cycle. Those are outstanding questions which are remaining completely unanswered. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question comes from uh, Louis Grau. And a good question. What, are the big, what were the biggest difficulties of running your model for 4.5 millennia? Well, actually, running for 4.5 millennia in a single site was much easier than running for three years in the entire Alpine region. Um, so, because of the overall, uh, it's a much simpler problem and also less computationally expensive, if you think about it. So, that was not particularly challenging. The challenge there was how you to reconstruct properly the climate. So, we have done a lot of work on weather generators. I also have done that. Uh, in the past, I mean, didn't have time today to present, but the reconstruction was quite challenging, but running the model itself was not uh, problematic. Of course, I mean, we had to, to, to be sure that everything was going smoothly, vegetation was never dying and so on. And uh, actually the test simulation, we had one time step where solar radiation was peaking to, I don't know, 3,000 or 5,000 watts per square meter for some error of the weather generator, and we were frying vegetation. But after we solved that, uh, we were, everything went smoothly for the entire 4,500 years. I think the big challenge is still running distributed simulation for long periods. Uh, we will have now probably a project on the Tibetan Plateau and uh, Himalaya region, and that's even more challenging because larger area, uh, poor data constraint, but uh, yeah, the, the distributed simulation are still extremely computationally challenging for the typical resources the ecohydrology spare. If we will be Google or, or even climate sciences, probably will be much easier because they have much more access to computational resources and also 
uh, people with the skills dedicated to, to those tasks. Okay, thank you. All right, the next question comes from Yijiang Zheng, and it's a little bit of a long question. Uh, from your conclusion slide, I see some emphasis on the impact from the above ground, for example, elevated CO2. What would you suggest from the below ground part, groundwater dynamics, geothermal, and, and what is your view on the role of plant hydraulics in all of this? Well, it's a lot of questions in one. <laughs> so I think in terms of below ground compartments, uh, um, there are outstanding uh, question related to everything which you can call the soil structure preferential flow flows uh, which are affecting a lot of the dynamics of subsurface flow and the transport of uh, contaminant solutes which uh, definitely needs to be addressed uh, in uh, some uh, uh, eventually even innovative way in comparison to what we do because there it's where the the effect of heterogeneities are manifesting mostly. So it's where heterogeneity and of the subsurface is really playing a dominant role and affecting potentially the results. Uh, so I was talking, I was focusing mostly on where I was confident on our result. When it comes to thermal processes, except I think region where you really have this coupling of frozen soil, like a permafrost region. Otherwise, I don't think it will be that, uh, I think we can solve that fairly well up to now. Uh, when it comes to soil by microbial dynamics on the subsurface, we are just uh, scratching the surface at the moment uh, of what we can do on those models. So there is a long way, uh, a long way to go. And I probably forgot what was the final part of the question, but uh, uh, yeah. let's see. Um, I'm, I'm going to actually ask ask another question, sort of similar, okay. so um, to keep going on this subject of, of heterogeneity. Uh, Soil variables, this is from uh, Taylor McDowell. Soil variables tend to be highly variable across small scales, sometimes smaller scales than the grid cells in certain models. How do we begin to incorporate processes at different scales in our models? That's an open-ended question. <laughs> yeah, I think this is the question that the entire uh, hydrological community is asking us in several, right? And uh, it's uh, indeed uh, very relevant. I think, I mean, uh, uh, Many have argued that we need the subgrid parameterization uh, uh, to account for certain type of heterogeneities. And I think uh, super smart people have tried uh, to come up with those uh, for several decades, uh, but uh, ultimately what I see the community is going and we also go, it's to decrease the resolution, to decrease the resolution, to decrease the resolution. And I think at a certain point, we will arrive to a resolution which is decent enough uh, uh, to reproduce uh, most of the heterogeneities, at least the one we can observe on the surface, and maybe some we can also speculate on the subsurface. And uh, for certain problems, this could be, ex I mean, if we don't get there, could be extremely significant, like a solute dynamics I was mentioning before. For other problems, maybe even though if we neglect some of these heterogeneity may be less important. Now I remember also the last second part of the last question about plant hydraulics. So plant hydraulics is going to be a very important uh, component uh, of all these models, which is uh, not fully included yet uh, in what we were doing, at least uh, at the larger scale. We have done other works at smaller scale or three scale where we deal only with plant hydraulics. So that will be relevant. Uh, and, and definitely, it's one of the components which is emerging in many of the models. Uh, but again, it needs to be Many of the observations we have needs to be used very carefully once implemented in model at ecosystem scale or large scale. So. Okay, thank you. And, and Veronica Morales asks a, a question which will add to, to, to your answer here, I think. Can you speak to the rem other gaps in data available to better validate or confirm your models? You've mentioned some. Okay, okay. So let me maybe tackle the problem. Generally, as I was saying, the ideal situation is where you have the many different suite of different data. Because if you have only one type of data, you tend to be biased in trying to match that. Because I was mentioning before, natural system, when they are observed, especially at large scale, are very, the observation are really uncertain. But if you have observation, you tend to believe more that, which is many times correct to do, and, and you tend to bias somehow your vision for the observation you have. 
If you have a multiple type of observation, in the case I was making with the visimeter and flux tower, I think it's a, a very nice example. But generally, if you have data about vegetation productivity, about uh, uh, fluxes, uh, energy fluxes, about uh, subsurface dynamic of temperature of soil moisture, then you start to see that the many pieces go together. And some of the dynamics you reproduce, if you don't constrain enough uh, many of the parameters will be completely off at least for one of those components. So I, I, I think it's really the combination of many different data streams that they are going together to constrain the model rather than investing heavily on one type of data. And definitely there is this huge uh, gap, uh, gap between uh, what we know on the above surface mm -hmm. and what we know on the subsurface. This is uh, very, very evident. Okay, thank you. I think we'll we'll just go with one last question. We're getting close to the top of the hour, and this comes from from Dave Chandler. And you mentioned this a little bit, um, talking about the Australian fires. But have you considered the long-term effects of fires, and where are you going with um, incorporating fire into the uh, your modeling? Well, that will be a probably totally a new presentation. But uh, yes, when we include the fire, we were trying to understand mostly the uh, vegetation productivity and hydrological response subse subsequently to the fire uh, in the order of maybe a few decades. And we were actually finding uh, in the model a very, very quick recovery of all the vegetation functioning and hydrology, which is supported at least by one flux tower data in Wallaby Creek, uh, which is actually showing even a faster recovery than the model. But I admit that there could be some other effect like related to uh, water repellency of the soil or subtle change in the ecosystem and so on, which may play a role in much longer time scale, which may not be included in this type of model. So this type of hydrological terrestrial ecosystem model I was presenting, I think he has as a, uh, depending on the ecosystem, we can go from a few decades, in some cases to a few centuries, or in case of simpler ecosystem like shrubs or grassland I was showing, I'm confident to simulate the dynamic even of several centuries. But when it comes to more complex uh, dynamics uh, where you have a transition of different ecosystem, then it comes uh, a different story. I think where ecology has a major role, which uh, we don't include uh, completely. The advantage may be that we have our, our ecology uh, and paleoecological colleagues have been studying those transitions and have have the data at times for when those transitions have occurred and our archaeology yeah. colleagues as well all right yeah we, we yeah. definitely yeah. need to collaborate more <laughs> with uh, with people from different disciplines as i was stressing from the beginning <laughs> excellent very good i think that uh we're right at the top of the hour almost so i just uh, i think we will conclude this seminar and if uh, our audience, uh, if you will, please give me a thanks, give Simone a thanks for his wonderful presentation. And we had an outstanding group of questions and outstanding attendees. We had at one point about 200 people on. So thank you very much, Simone, thank you. And if you'll just flip to the next slide, Simone, just so yep. we can give an introduction for next week. We still, we have another seminar, there we go. Uh, very good. So next week, same time, same place, Nico Wanders will be talking about the frontiers in hydroclimate change. I will be sending out uh, the link. Uh, the link is out there, but I will resend to all of you uh, via the, the uh, AGU discussion email, and it'll also be on the website as well as on Twitter. So please join us for our third and final um, hydro, uh, Young Early Career Awardee webinar series. And have a great week. And again, let's give a thanks to Simone. And thank you very much, Simone. Enjoy and have a great weekend, all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.